Raise that up.
slave to fear we want to go around the problem right well that's not what we're, we're to do you know god didn't move the sea he parted the sea for us to go through the problem right and that's part of growing in his in, in, in his kingdom is to go through the problem we all want to try to go around the problem god is telling us right now he split the sea for us to go through it amen Amen. We will become victorious on the other side. Yes. Lord, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I am no longer a slave to anything. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Pastor. Yes. ¿Te acuerdas cuando Jesús se encuentra con la mujer en el pozo? Help me out. So do you remember the, when Jesus goes and meets with the woman at the well? Yes. The Samaritana. The Samaritan, yeah. Como Jesús le dice, dame de beber. He tells her, give me to drink. Yeah. Amen. O sea, Jesús portaba algo. God, Jesus has something in him. Que ella no tenía. Yeah. That she didn't have. Right. Amen. Nosotros portamos algo que We have something that a lot of people don't have. Es el yes. de vida. That's right. Is that, is that uh, uh, eternal water? Right. Eso que esta mañana alabamos a Dios. That's what we worship God. Yes. Esa vida que está en nosotros. Yes. Esa agua de vida que está en nosotros. It is, it is, it is water that is alive. Pero tenemos que encontrarnos con alguien. Amen. We have to go with you to people y brindarles esa agua. And Amen. tell them, hey, you want what I have. Así That's que, right. Dios, gracias a Dios por cada uno de los que están aquí presentes. We thank God for everybody who's in here. This Porque Dios nos eligió cada uno. Because you are chosen That's para right. esa agua. to carry that water. Y yes. Y la necesitamos. Amen. Those who need it. Amen. Amen. Good word. Good word. Wow. Uh, so the Lord has been dealing with me on a subject this morning um, uh, regarding. This will work better if I turn it on. Regarding emotional healing. Okay. You know, the care of Jesus that you is that you be in divine health. How many of you know that Jesus wants you in divine health? He created you to be in divine health. There was no sickness in the garden, but the curse opened us up to less than what we were created to be. Can I get an amen? Fortunately, our Father is Lord over all of creation, and in response to the curse, He has become a healing God. 
Now, when we think of health and healing, we immediately think of the body. Why? Because the older we get, the less this body functions as we expect it to function. You wake up and where you would once leap out of bed, now it's more like, oh, let me get the feeling back in my legs. And... But that's not God's plan for your life. God wants you in divine health. Body, mind, and spirit. God Almighty wants us to be whole. And we, where we, 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 we come into the church and we focus on the spiritual, we go to the doctors, we focus on the physical, there is one area that we seem not to stress. If you, if you have your Bibles this morning, I want to read a short passage of Scripture here. A passage of Scripture that uh, is very familiar to you. It is um, 3 John chapter 1, verse 2. That Scripture reference in purple is not easy to read, is it? 3 John chapter 1, verse 2. That'll be more readable when I replace that projector. Uh, when I get up on a ladder and replace that projector. We have the projector, we just don't have, uh, have a pastor with enough guts to climb the ladder yet. So, But I'll get there. The Bible says, Lo, I'm with you always, and I want to be low. <laughs> <laughs> 3 John chapter 1, verse 2 the, King, uh, the NIV says, Dear friends, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you even as your soul is getting along well. The King James translates it a little differently. He's, it says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. Now, watch this. Are you ready? When we read that scripture, we read prosperity and health. Woo! I'm going to get the money and I'm going to be healthy. But there is a qualifier in this passage. There is something that is required in order for us to be prosperous and in health. The Bible says, only if your soul prospers. You're not going to prosper in your bank account unless your soul prospers. You're not going to prosper in your body unless your soul prospers. So we read that. And now we can see the qualifier there. The prosperity of all of our life is requiring the prosperity of our soul. And we know holistically that we are made up in three parts. Body, soul, and spirit. That's our three, three makeup. Body, that, that goes without explanation. It's this flesh. Flesh at some point that's going to expire. But we know that once we this body does, is, is gone, that we live on as a spirit man. Amen? So the body has a time limit. The spirit is eternal. But a lot of what we go through, body and spirit, is driven by the soul. You say, how do you know that? Because the soul is made up of three parts. Mind, will, and emotions. 
How many of you know that a lot of what happens in your body is a result of what you've made up in your mind you're going to be? You're only as young as you feel? Only as young as you have made yourself think you are? I can't tell you the number of people who I've gone and visited in the hospital and they were sick in body and they were at the point of death and they were at the point of death solely because they have given up in their mind. The mind, the will, and the emotions is the driving factor of all that we are. The body has a limited lifetime. The spirit is eternal, but I want to focus on the soul this morning for just a moment. The soul being the driver. The soul made up of three parts, mind, will, and emotions. If you think about what the scriptures say, what does the scripture say about the mind? As a man thinketh, thinketh, the Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart. Where's your thinker? Hello? Am I here? Uh, anybody getting this? As a man thinketh, so is he. Your thoughts are a driving force for your whole life. Mind is a driver. However you think of yourself, that's what you're going to be. Why do you think parents try to instill in their children you can be anything you want to be? You can be president if you want to be president. I don't know why you'd want to be president, but whatever. I don't want to be president, okay? You do? All right, you got my vote. Tanner for president. His, his slogan is, Tan man will tan your can. <laughs> he can be the new Trump. He can get in there and just lay it all. That's good. Tanner, you got my vote. But the Bible also talks about will. In Philippians chapter 2, let's see, do I have these scriptures? No. In Philippians chapter 2, Verses 12 and 13, it reads this way. Therefore, my friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Why? For it is God who works in you to will and to act. Your will drives your actions. That's why people say, well, I just, I, I can't come to that service. I just don't have time. You have time to do what you want. I'm convinced of that. I won't argue with anybody. Uh, I don't have time to go come to Wednesday night service. Okay, fine. You don't want to come. It ain't about time. It's about will. For it is God who works in you to will. And not just to will to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. If it, it, God is saying that the will that you have, if you're a believer, is it's because those things that you desire, particularly that are kingdom uh, 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 involving the kingdom, is because he gave you that will. You know, we come in here, we want the presence of God, but nobody in their right mind would want the presence of God except He give us that will. Nobody would want to come and, uh, and spend their Sundays when they could be laying in the bed, munching on popcorn and watching a movie, but He gave us a will that we want to participate in the kingdom. And so we have mind, will, but the one that we seem to struggle with the most is this area called emotion. And 
and emotions are found throughout all of Scripture, beginning back in the garden. Do you remember what happened when Adam sinned? What was the first emotion that he experienced? He feared. He, he realized he was naked and he hid himself because he was fearful of God that day. And since the garden, there have been emotions that we've been dealing with all of this time. Adam feared. Moses feared. Moses got angry. David lusted. He became arrogant. Uh, throughout Scripture, we pe see people who loved, rejoiced, feared, desired, got angry, experienced peace, joy, wrath, happiness, and even hate. All of which are emotions. But emotions are not limited to just us. The Bible says that God the Father also exhibits motion, emotions. The Bible says he experiences hate, anger, jealousy, sorrow, joy, compassion, and love. Not in that order. So God the Father is also an emotional being. And we know that Jesus was a reflection of the heart of the Father. Jesus experienced emotions as well. He felt compassion. He got angry. He was indignant. He was consumed with zeal. He was troubled, greatly distressed, very sorrowful, depressed, uh, deeply moved, grieved. He sighed. He wept. He sobbed. He groaned. He was in agony. He was surprised and amazed. He rejoiced very greatly. He was full of joy. He greatly desired and he loved. All of which are emotions. So emotions are not just part of life, but is an important part of our life and walk. So in order for you to be healthy holistically, all components of your soul, your mind, your will, and emotions have to be healthy. One of the things that corporations have come to realize is that during COVID, it really had an impact on people's minds, wills, and emotions. People are struggling with mental health issues more so because of COVID than for any other event. And so now the corporations, they've got uh, the wellness programs that they include, uh, not just physical wellness, but uh, uh, emotional wellness as well. As, as I mentioned in my first scripture today in 3 John, he said, Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. In other words, you're never going to be healthy until your soul is healthy. Mind, will, and emotions. In my studies recently, I've been studying the differences of Jesus' ministry before the crucifixion and after his resurrection. Because the two ministries were, were not, in, not the same, not in the least. Prior to the crucifixion, Jesus was doing healings. He was doing miracles. The lame walk, the blind see, the deaf ear, the dead are raised. He's preaching the word. People are getting saved. After the resurrection, none of that happened. I don't see a single miracle that he performed except his ascension into heaven. Now, granted, it's showing up in a room, that's a miracle, but I mean, it wasn't really affecting, it wasn't, you know, a healing, it wasn't, you know, a tangible type thing. So I've been, just, I, I've been studying the differences, but I, uh, you, to my surprise, 
almost all of the appearances of jesus after the resurrection was for the purpose of healing emotions watch this over the next few weeks I don't know how many weeks it's going to take me to do this. I'm just going to go with it. But over the next few weeks, I want to look at the encounters that Christ had after the resurrection and who he was ministering to and what emotion he was dealing with. We're going to look at Jesus' appearance to Peter. We're going to look at his appearance to Mary Magdalene. We're going to look at his appearance to the two guys on the road to Emmaus, which I preached on a few weeks ago. We're going to look at the disciples without Thomas. We're going to look at the disciples with Thomas. And then we're going to look at the seven disciples at the Sea of Galilee. So this week I want to start, well, that's my introduction. Uh, I'm not going to get through with this. But that's okay. You know, do y'all remember the cliffhanger years ago? The very first one that they did on television. It was on the show Dallas. Okay? And, they, and at the very end of the season, J.R. got shot. And then they stop the season and you couldn't find out who shot jr till the next season began it was a called a cliffhanger and all of the newspapers reported who shot jr and everybody speculated on how the who so somebody must have got jr and is jr going to survive of course he is he's the star okay but that was a new thing who shot jr well this is going to be a cliffhanger as well. Maybe not as dramatic as shooting JR, but let's take a minute and look at Peter. The Apostle Peter began his adult life by the name of Simon. He was a commercial fisherman, mainly in the Sea of Galilee, together with his younger brother Andrew. It is suggested that they used to hang out together with James and John, who were the sons of Zebedee, who were also fishermen. And we know commercial fishermen are skilled. Not like a Gary Doherty fisherman, where you, you might catch something and you might not catch something. Commercial fishermen were skilled. They did it for a living. It was not an easy task to move your boat from the bank to the, to the deep, it's not like they had a mercury engine on the back. I'm going to have an outboard. They didn't have an outboard. They didn't even have a squirrel turning a prop, I'm telling you. It wasn't an easy task to move the boat to the deep. It wasn't an easy task to throw those nets. How many of you have ever tried to throw a net? Okay. Boy, that takes more skill than it, than, than, than it, 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 it's a lot harder than it looks, for sure. Because not only do you have to throw the net, but while you're throwing, it's got to open up. And then, and then it's got to sink down before the fish run off. It requires a skill set that I don't have, frankly. But they had to learn how to throw nets, how to repair nets. You drop that net in the wrong place, get it hung on something, you're going to tear the net. If what happens if you tear the net? You're going to lose your fish. And not only that, they had to, had to learn how to repair nets with wet hands. Someone that has their hands in water all the time, what happens to your hands? It wrinkles up the fingertips and they become... You know, the whole hand after a while, if it stays in water, it, it becomes wrinkly and puffy. And, and so they were accustomed to not only doing that, but they had the calluses on their hands from working with the nets and catching the fish. And how many of you know that when you catch fish, something 
one of them's going to fin you. All right, I, I can do the catfish hug on a catfish and keep him from finning me. But eventually, when you catch a fish, one of them's going to get you. Right? And then there's also having to clean fish. Because you don't eat fish unless you clean fish. So you got to be able to handle a knife. So here you are, you're scaling and you're cutting and you're gutting and you're using the knife and at some point your hands are going to get cut up. It's part of being a commercial fisherman. And let's face it. Fishermen probably aren't all the most pleasing to the eye. You know, it's not like Peter had, or Simon had an instant shower so that when he got through fishing, he could go shower off. He didn't have a way to remove the smell of fish from his hands. And let's face it, they're working the night shift. I, 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 I talked to Jeff. Jeff works all kinds of shifts. They, they adjust his shifts every few weeks. And I've worked the night shift before, but man, when I worked the night shift, I was crazy. Because I couldn't sleep in the day, and if, and if I could sleep, people were waking me up, and the light outside would wake you up, and you're always tired if you're working the night shift. Commercial fishermen are working the night shift. Why? Because you throw the net out, the fish can't see the net coming. So we know that they were probably known for their roughness. They were also likely known socially for their crudeness. After all, we know that Peter fished in his underwear. He did. He did, Tanner, I promise you. I'll show you in the scripture. Peter fished in his undies. So that's probably not socially acceptable. If you don't believe me, go fish in your underwear and pull up at the boat dock and see what happens. People are going to look at you pretty goofy. And commercial fishing in Galilee, where Simon was fishing, probably yielded poverty. When we think of fishing, we're going out here in the bay, we're going to catch us some of those big saltwater fish, and we're going to cut the steaks off of them. Well, see, Galilee's freshwater. It's like going to Blackwater and catching brim all day long. You could starve to death. You could catch 50 brim and not make $10, okay? So probably Simon was dealing with pro with poverty. And like all fishermen, fishermen have the unique ability to exaggerate. Uh, yeah, that fish was this long. You should have saw the one that got away. Am I the only one that does that? I don't think, uh, yeah. I'm taking you fishing. We're going to test that. <laughs> we also know that Simon was married. The Gospels record that Simon had a mother-in-law who was sick with a fever. You can't have a mother-in-law unless you have a wife. So, Paul even wrote in 1 Corinthians, and I won't go there, 1 Corinthians 9, 5, Paul talks about Peter having the freedom to take a wife. So we know that Simon was married. 
We know that he was called to be a disciple of Jesus at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. It was through a demonstration of the power of God that he went from skilled fisherman to blessed fisher of men. Jesus used his boat as a preaching platform. It wasn't designed to be a preaching platform. You know, there's a whole message that I could preach there on God being able to use even that which wasn't designed for that purpose. God is not limited to the, uh, uh, to the design of your vessel. But I'll skip through that. Jesus used it as a preaching platform and then after the fishermen were tired and had already cleaned their nets, don't you just love it? Couldn't you have did this before I washed the nets? He asked them to put out to the deep for a catch. And Simon obeyed and reaped a tremendous harvest. If you watch the video from The Chosen, if you haven't, you need to go out on YouTube and YouTube it because it's out there. I showed it to somebody in Africa. They tried to give you an illustration of just what it looked like when those fish hit that net. And it was at this point when those nets began to burst that Simon walked away from everything he knew to follow Jesus. Over time, he grew to be recognized as the leader and the most outspoken of the twelve disciples. When Jesus was at Caesarea Philippi and Jesus was asking the questions, who do men say that I am? Why would he ask that? He's trying to evaluate how effective his ministry is. What kind of impact is he having on people's lives? And he asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? Well, some say you're Elijah, some say you're another prophet. Nobody is saying that you're the Messiah. And he's, he said, who do you say that I am? It was Simon that spoke up first. Oh, you're the Messiah. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And it was so profound and so impactful, not just on Simon's life, but on all of the disciples, that Jesus decided to draw a line in the sand and change Peter's name from Simon to Cephas, or Peter, meaning the rock. Couldn't you have named me something a little more elaborate than a rock? But that was the name you got. You're the rock. And as Peter, he witnessed all of the miracles of Jesus. All. He received a calling to minister. He got out and ministered under the power of God. And demons were cast out. And people were healed. And they were amazed that even the demons were subject to their ministry. Peter personally witnessed Jesus' transformation on the Mount of Transfiguration. And Peter participated in the Last Supper. It was Peter that attempted to put an end to Jesus' arrest by trying to cut his way out with a sword. I'm going to pave the way for you, Jesus. I'm going to take this joker's head off and you need to run for it. Well, Jesus wasn't interested in running and Peter was not really good with a sword. He was a fisherman. If it had been a fishing rod, maybe. And he missed the guy's head and cut off his ear. Jesus looked at him and said, duh. No. <laughs> he said, I'll fix this. And he did. And Peter 
was so sold out that it is believed that he died a martyr for his faith after watching his wife be martyred first. Although his death is not described in scripture, numerous writers of the time described his and her death as having occurred in Rome. His execution was ordered by the Roman Emperor Nero in A.D. 64, who blamed the cities. They, they had a big fire, and, and it got out of control, and a lot of the city was burned. So he, politically, he needed somebody to blame, so he blamed the city's Christians for this fire, and so he started crucifying the Christians. Peter, according to tradition, didn't feel worthy to be crucified in the same manner as Christ. And he asked to be crucified upside down. And that request was honored. So Peter lived a very unique life. Most of us, at some point in his life, can relate to what he was going through. I understand picking out the sword and wanting to clean somebody's clock. I understand not. Uh, I understand the 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 um, uh, the amazement when you go out and you minister and God uses you and it, it blows your mind. I can relate to those things. But Peter is more often remembered not for what he did right, but what he did wrong. Most people criticized Peter because he lost his focus and he didn't, uh, he almost drowned when Jesus was trying to get him to walk on the water. Well, let me tell you something in Peter's defense. He did walk on the water. It may have only been a few steps, but he stepped out on nothing and landed on something. But Peter is remembered more for his failure than for his accomplishments. And next week, we're going to look at the emotion that Jesus dealt with in Peter's life. Stand to your feet and let me pray over you this morning.